Mr. Goenka, both former and current, uh, Mr. Jha, Mr. Vigramji, my former boss, Mr. Chidambaram, uh, Ms. Ishwar Judge Aluwalia, and other distinguished guests in the audience. Um, it gives me great pleasure to deliver this first Ramnath Goenka lecture. As you know, Sri Goenka was a freedom fighter who built the Indian Express into a national newspaper. In his time, it was arguably the best investigative newspaper in the country. I won't comment on which one is the best one now for fear of upsetting some sensibilities. Um, he was instrumental in highlighting the excesses of the emergency, which uh, probably contributed to uh, Ms. Indira Gandhi's defeat when she lifted it. He continued to be a tireless scourge of corruption and government high-handedness and was responsible for unsettling many a minister and business tycoon. Probably be fitting in a lecture in his memory to speak about the efforts that India has been making on increasing transparency and curbing corruption. However, I've said what I needed to on that elsewhere and uh, there's a lot of commentary anyway in, uh, in the press today. Instead, what I want to do is speak on India's engagement with the global economy and how best to manage it in these turbulent times. Now, as you know, the global economy hasn't been growing uh, particularly fast. In fact, the IMF every year starts out with optimistic uh, expectations of growth and through the year keeps revising it downwards and this has been happening for the last three or four years. So why has the recovery uh, been so slow and how should we deal with it? Well first the answer to why the recovery has been so slow is a matter of great debate. There are some people who say it's because uh, the world took on too much debt in the lead up to the financial crisis and that debt is serving as an overhang. Uh, households in the U.S. have too much debt, aren't willing to spend. Corporations uh, in Europe, in India, have too much debt, can't invest. And, of course, banks have too little capital and can't lend. And this, sort of, this combined with governments uh, running out of fiscal space because they've borrowed too much, all en ends up in, uh, in uh, very slow growth. So the remedy for this is typically to write down the debt, to um, say that this is unsustainable and has to be written down. The problem, of course, is it becomes politically very difficult to do it. And uh, uh, large-scale debt write-offs typically require national consensus and typically don't happen because everybody is wondering who gets the benefits and who pays for it. But I think the other thing to think about is that why was there so much debt buildup before the crisis? Why did you know Spain, Portugal, the United States, uh, all these countries go overboard? And today, of course, China has gone overboard over the last four or five years in borrowing. Why has this happened? And perhaps the answer is that really the debt, uh, the debt fueled spending before hides a fall in global potential growth. The growth actually has fallen for different reasons. And in an attempt to keep growth up across the world, there was overspending, whether by households or by governments. Now, what could these factors be? One very important factor that uh, certainly Ruchir Sharma has started talking about is population aging. That across the industrial world, populations have been growing older. In fact, in a number of countries, Japan to begin with, the working age population is actually shrinking. The labor force is shrinking, which means growth, unless you have very strong productivity growth, is going to fall. Uh, but combined with this is the fact that productivity growth has not been increasing. And this is something that people wonder about. Why in this world where there's so much innovation, so much technology, so much talk about Google, about, uh, about Facebook, and so on, do we find that productivity growth is so miserable? And here again, there are lots of debates about what's really going on. Some people say, we're actually not measuring it. You're much better off than you think. Um, you know, you don't spend your evenings going to a movie theater anymore. 
you basically you know spend your time on on the computer see all the movies you want uh, travel all the newspapers you want without paying for them and so essentially you have a better life today but it's not being monetized not being captured in the GDP numbers so that's one version of it uh, another version of it is what Robert Gordon has been talking about in his most recent book, but of course in a number of papers before, which is, you know, the kind of advances represented by Facebook and, uh, and Twitter are really tiny compared to what happened in the past, uh, in the not so, not so distant past. For example, think of the motor car, uh, the advent of the motor car relative to the horse-drawn carriage. That was a huge advance. The advent of the aeroplane, the advent of, uh, of uh, the telegraph or the telephone, those were huge advances compared to you know, the 140 characters on Twitter. Uh, those are relatively minor. Yes, you can communicate better, but you still could communicate through the telephone in real time in the past. So the point here is that maybe you know, productivity growth is not showing up because there isn't any uh, relative to the past. And the, the, the counter camp says, yeah, no, 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 productivity growth is there. We're not monetizing it. We're not measuring it. Um, be that as it may, the point is the measured GDP growth numbers are really very low in industrial countries. And um, so what do you do to, to increase the rate of growth? Because there's so much demand for growth. There are so many young people coming into the labor force. Uh, unemployment rates uh, in some, some categories are close to 50%. Uh, a lot of angst. And uh, angst, of course, creates eventually people walking out on the street and social conflict. Certainly some of what we are seeing in the elections in uh, the United States and elsewhere uh, reflect some of this concern. Now, the economists would say do structural reforms, that is, uh, basically uh, do the things that up the rate of growth uh, because they make uh, the country more productive. Uh, problem, as uh, uh, I keep uh, repeating this classic phrase of Jean-Claude Juncker, the former Luxembourg prime minister, which was, you know, in the face of all the structural reforms that uh, he knew uh, they had to do, he said, um, at the height of the Euro crisis, we all know what to do. We just don't know how to get re-elected after we do it. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's the problem with structural reforms. They tend to upset constituencies. Why? Because the costs are immediate. The costs are well-defined. They hit. I mean, think of Uber coming in. The taxi driver who loses his job to Uber knows fully well what's happened. But all the possible Uber drivers in the future who are going to have different livelihoods, part-time jobs, etc., don't yet know they're going to be Uber drivers. So there's a well-defined constituency which opposes it, the taxi drivers who have current jobs. There's an ill-defined constituency which doesn't know whether to support it or not, all the potential people, uh, including the users who could benefit. Now, what this means, and this was a talk I just gave uh, at the IMF uh, conference, uh, is that countries are engaging because the clear paths for growth they cannot adopt. The, uh, they're engaging in more and more aggressive monetary policy. We've seen uh, increasingly innovative acronyms, uh, increasingly innovative actions. We moved into negative interest rates, and it's getting more negative over time. Now, what this, this does to a country like ours is it creates volatility. It creates volatility because uh, we experience significant shifts in the exchange rate as a result of some of these actions. Some of you who are market watchers know what happened when China moved its exchange rate in August and again in January. Uh, but, but not only does it create volatility uh, as far as the exchange rate goes, it sort of creates waves of capital going in and waves of capital going out, not at the time of our choosing, not based on our fundamentals, but based on activities elsewhere. And so one of the important things to emphasize uh, to countries abroad is they have to wo worry about the spillover effects of their actions on countries like ours, and they can be uh, pretty substantial. So we are effectively 
in a somewhat manic depressive global environment where the investor wakes up in the morning and says, should I be optimistic, uh, risk on mode as some people in the market call it, or should I be pessimistic and risk off? In the pessimistic mode, every emerging market looks bad. Uh, you highlight all the downside problems in these markets, the political difficulties, etc. Uh, and in your optimistic mode, everything looks wonderful. Growth is going to go on forever at 7 8%. So given this, what should we as a country do in the face of this kind of uncertainty? And, and what I would emphasize is we need macroeconomic stability. That has to be the platform on which we, we, build, we'll, we, we build growth. And I think that platform has been in the building for some time now. Uh, we started with an emphasis on fiscal prudence when uh, Mr. Chidambaram came back into the finance ministry in 2012. And uh, that path has continued. Uh, the current budget emphasizes the need to adhere to the fiscal consolidation path even while allocating resources to capital spending and focusing on structural reforms, especially in agriculture. So with this, uh, I think the fall in the bond yields that followed on the budget announcements suggested that the budget had an extremely important effect in calming market investors with the government's overall message. What we can also argue is that ever since the days we had large current account deficits in the early, in the 2012-2013 period, fiscal consolidation has also helped narrow the current account deficit. And uh, today we have a current account deficit which is fully financed by foreign direct investment. In fact, overfinanced by the foreign direct investment that is coming in. Um, as you know, inflation is also down since the days of double-digit CPI inflation. Uh, we have today an inflation-focused monetary framework, which I believe will be strengthened by the constitution of the Monetary Policy Committee, which has been mooted in the finance bill. So while I personally, as RBI governor, can no longer s will no longer be able to set monetary policy unilaterally, I believe the shifting of the power uh, to a committee is absolutely in the economy's interest. Not only will a committee aggregate multiple views better than any single individual, uh, it will also offer more continuity. If one person in the committee moves off, it won't change policy overnight. If a governor uh, changes, it won't shift policy overnight. And moreover, a committee will be less subject to the pushes and pulls and the influence and pressure that typically fall on central banks. So I believe that the monetary reforms that have been undertaken by this government will be an important and signal achievement. Uh, of course, it has been some time in the making. The last leg of the stabilization agenda is to clean up the stressed assets in the banking sector so that banks have the room to lend again. Now, the, this has been a problem that has built up over time. And part of the problem is the banks didn't have enough power to get promoters to pay or to put the stressed assets back on track. They didn't have the right kinds of tools. And unlike a more developed country, we didn't have a functioning bankruptcy system. Now, bankruptcy systems work either by taking the borrower into bankruptcy or working as a threat by which the borrower agrees to out-of-court settlements, knowing that if that doesn't happen, the borrower gets dragged through the bankruptcy court. Now, without a bankruptcy court, neither was, was possible. What we've been doing over time is to give the banks the powers so that effectively they can carry out an out-of-court resolution with the, with the borrower and put the stressed or stranded assets back on track. The primary importance for the country is the assets come back on track and start producing uh, either power or, uh, or steel or whatever. Uh, of course, we need to pin blame where blame, blame belongs. And if there was malfeasance, certainly malfeasance that was undertaken should be punished. However, let us separate the two. The asset is, itself is not a malfeasant asset. The asset itself is blameless, 
put the asset back on track, put the company that has been uh, created back on track, and let the course of the law follow where it will on dealing with the, uh, with the problems. Now, you know, by and large, there are a whole variety of reasons why assets have got into trouble. Uh, bad luck, bad structuring, over-indebtedness, over-optimism. Remember, all this was happening on the back of very strong seven, six, seven years of very strong growth since 2003. So there are lots of reasons apart from malfeasance, either on the side of the lender or on the side of the borrower. So let us be very careful that we don't taint every, every problem with the same brush. And let us also be careful that going forward, uh, we allow bankers to make reasonable decisions and to lend because this country absolutely needs a system that works in terms of lending to finance growth. Now, um, our intent, uh, let me end that with saying that our intent is to have clean and fully provisioned bank balance sheets by March 2017, and uh, we are uh, on our way there. Um, perhaps the most important difficulty in an argumentative society like India's is to persuade the public uh, of your point of view, in this case, the need for macroeconomic stability when growth is below expectation. So I started off by saying the world is growing slowly, lots of impatience in other countries. Same problem in India, that we're growing slowly relative to our expectations of what is possible. And therefore, it's very hard to persuade people that, you know, let's focus on macroeconomic stability. Growth will come. We're not saying don't grow. But let's not emphasize growth at the expense of macroeconomic stability. Uh, the constant call from the, from the commentators who oppose this uh, is, is sort of paraphrasing uh, uh, St. Augustine, uh, Lord, give us stability, but not just yet. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, an, it's basically, let's go for growth now, worry about stability later. Um, you know, usually they, they call on you to not be doctrinaire, because after all, only academic economists care about fiscal deficits. To be practical, uh, does it really matter if an NPA is recognized in a quarter or three? Um, you know, does it really matter? And to appreciate Indian realities. Everyone may say they hate inflation, but no one wants to really bear the pain of the disinflationary process. So these are all the advice you get. You know, uh, hang loose, uh, don't be too focused on uh, on macro stability, uh, let's, uh, let's just uh, uh, stimulate till we get growth back. And I think that's a dangerous path. I think that's a dangerous path. It's a path that has been followed by others, and we have seen where they have reached. Uh, you just have to look at our fellow BRIC countries to understand that probably our path is, is, is a little more stable than what others have been doing, because they have different environmental conditions they've had to deal with. Um, I do want to emphasize, and this is important for our foreign, uh, foreign uh, visitors, uh, that given the inhospitable world economy and two successive droughts in India, either of which we should have thrown the economy into a tailspin in the past, um, macroeconomic stabilization must be part of the reason why we have over 7% growth, low inflation, and a low current account deficit. Why we stand out. Let us not sneer at this level of growth, given what is happening elsewhere in the world, and given that our strongest growth was achieved when we had both agriculture going for us, rural demand going for us, and most importantly, the global economy going for us. And we, we tend to neglect that, we tend to forget that. This is pretty good growth, and, and I hope uh, and believe it will become stronger as we build on this sound base. Now, I want to talk specifically uh, as we go forward, building on this base, how we engage with the, with the global economy. And uh, let me start uh, first with, uh, uh, with one uh, worrying factor in, global, in the global economy, which is that trade used to grow faster than uh, global output. Uh, and in the last few years, it has been growing more slowly. Trade has been growing more slowly. There are a number of explanations. One 
pretty obvious explanation is that as countries get richer, they tend to consume more services. Services tend to be non-traded. I don't, I don't trade a haircut. Somebody from the U.S. can't give me a haircut, but they can certainly send me uh, Apple iPhones. And so as we move more towards services, Apple iPhones is a bad uh, example, cars. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we do import a lot of iPhones, but cars, U.S. cars, we don't import very many. Uh, but so services, uh, as we use more of them, there'll be less trade. Um, also, what we've seen in the last few years is capital goods investment has fallen off in the world. And capital goods investment tends also to be highly trade intensive. You import a lot of your capital goods from countries like Japan, from, uh, from countries like Japan, China, Germany, and that's also fallen off. And um, finally, and this is probably most worrisome, uh, which is that as um, industrial countries become technologically more advanced in flexible manufacturing, and as they become more competitive post-financial crisis, um, a lot more of their global supply chains are being drawn, drawn inward into their own country. They're pulling in no longer relying on long supply chains across countries. This is also happening with China, which is doing much more of its value added internally rather than buying in. China used to be the assembler for the world. That's changing tremendously. China is now becoming the source of value added. Global supply chains are contracting significantly. The point to take away from this, therefore, is that Indian trade is likely to be muted for some time, okay? And that's what this, uh, this, uh, this graph is showing, that our exports of goods and services has been coming down. Of course, a lot of us feel the pain and say India is spe doing specially badly, but if you look at this graph, it's hard to tell that India is that different from the uh, fall in trade of emerging markets. Emerging markets in general are doing badly and this is a global phenomenon uh, perhaps more focused on emerging markets but certainly it is the case that trade is, is, is falling off. Now um, there are some nuances when we look at trade in, in goods. We're doing a little worse when you look at the last few quarters in trade in goods that is manufactured goods. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at trade in services, uh, we're doing a little better, perhaps because the areas we export to, such as the United States, are starting to pick up more strongly. But the broader point I want you to take away is that uh, we're not alone in suffering a fall in trade. A number of our emerging market cousins are also uh, uh, suffering a fall in trade. Uh, and this is why, I mean, it's important to look out. Uh, we always think India is uh, sui generis, is, is, is one of its kind, and what happens to us doesn't happen anywhere else. Uh, but we must remember this is more a global phenomenon. And therefore, when we think about what we must do, we have to think about remedies which would attack the global problem, rather than think about country-specific remedies which may not help in the lar larger run. So um, while, uh, you know, for example, when we're looking at our poorer export performance, uh, we could uh, examine possible dumping in certain industries. Uh, we have to be careful about it because that may give that particular industry relief, uh, but it may increase the cost of inputs for another industry in the country which depends on inputs from that country. So we have to make sure that prices that increase in the protected industry doesn't make another industry uncomparative. And, and that's why we have to be careful at these times of slowing trade. Now, another potential concern at these times that people express is trade is slowing, but it's because the exchange rate is overvalued. Okay, now, it can't be true that all the emerging markets, the exchange rate is overvalued, and all of them have been suffering a fall in, uh, in trade. But let's examine the exchange rate and uh, ask the usual questions that my friend Surjit Palla here would, would ask about uh, the exchange rate. The, the point, uh, I think that's, that's clear, uh, is that uh, the stability of our currency 
uh, has meant uh, that uh, we have depreciated some against the dollar, which has, uh, has been a strong currency. About, uh, uh, if you look at this particular chart, it's about 6%. Uh, since about uh, uh, the 1st of January 2015, uh, which about reflects uh, largely the inflation differential with the United States. Um, so we've de depreciated about 6% against the dollar, but other currencies have depreciated even more against the dollar. If you look at the real, the ruble, uh, the peso, the Argentinian peso, number of countries have depreciated more. So from a comparativeness, comparativeness perspective, what is important is have we depreciated more or less than our comparator economies, right? And therefore, economists would say, let's look at the nominal effective exchange rate, which compares the rupee's value against other exchange rates, weighing each by their share in trade. And that's, that's what I do in the next uh, uh, chart. And this is India's nominal effective exchange rate uh, calculated in two ways. Essentially what this says is since around the beginning of 2015, it has been relatively fat, flat. Now you could say it was appreciating since 2013 August, but remember that was a time of great disequilibrium during the taper tantrum when our exchange rate plummeted. And then we stabilized and so much of that movement upwards could be the stabilization. Over the last year, it has generally been flat, a nominal effective exchange rate. We've weakened against the dollar, we have strengthened against the euro. One of my problems of often when I read the press commentary on our exchange rate is there'll be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, breast beating about, oh, we're reaching a low against the dollar. But if the dollar is reaching a high against everybody else, uh, we may be quite, quite reasonable. And that's what this graph is showing that from nominal effective terms, even though you may feel we are close to a low point in the rupee dollar exchange rate at about 67, that in fact uh, we have been flat for some time. Now, this is where Surjit will say that, you know, don't worry about the nominal effective exchange rate, worry about the real effective exchange rate. And let me explain to our non-economist friends what that means. Uh, let's say a widget cost a dollar to make a year ago in the United States. A year ago it cost a dollar to make in the United States and it cost 63 rupees in India to make that widget. Now given the dollar rupee exchange rate a year ago was about 63, you would say India was competitive at that point. 63 rupees it cost to make the widget, cost a dollar in the US, cost the same in both countries translating at the exchange rate to make that widget. Now supposing India has 5% inflation and supposing the US has 0% inflation. Now if the exchange rate remained the same, what would happen is India would become uncomparative, right? Because costs have gone up by 5%. So the cost of making the widget in India now is 66.2. The cost of making the widget in the US still remains 63 because they make it at a dollar, dollars worth 63 rupees. And so with the exchange rate remaining the same, essentially they can make it cheaper than we can make it. So if your currency remains the same, but you're inflating at a higher rate than the rest of the world, you suffer what is called real appreciation and you become increasingly uncompetitive. What is needed is your currency should depreciate at the rate at which uh, the inflation differentials are. That is, that is standard uh, economics. And by the way, for people in the press, I'm not advocating a depreciation of the rupee. <laughs> Sometimes these phrases are taken out of context and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this, is not, this is not anything normative. This is just a, a statement of fact. Uh, so this is what the real effective exchange rate looks like for the rupee. Uh, that again, taking into account inflation differentials, uh, we have remained again about relatively flat since, uh, uh, since the beginning of uh, 2015. Of course, again, we have appreciated since that low which we reached in uh, the taper tantrum in, in uh, August of 2013, but uh, we have remained relatively flat. Now, um, sort of uh, this chart also reflects the fact that uh, um, you know, uh, the truth is in the eye of the beholder. 
if somebody wants to complain about the rupee being a source of overvaluation, and I have some commentator friends in the press who actually say that, they point to the low there and say from there to now there's a 20% appreciation of the rupee. So there's a 20% appreciation of the rupee, therefore the rupee is overvalued. Because somebody who wants to say that's not why trade is falling off would point to the flat region and say for the last year and, a, and some it's been relatively flat. Can't be that that's the primary reason. Then we could have a debate about lags in, in, in exports and so on. Uh, let's not go there. Let me just say that there's another reason to believe that exchange rates aren't the reason that, uh, uh, that, that one has to worry um, about our slower export growth, and that is uh, uh, productivity differentials. Now, for a country like India, where we are growing because we are learning to do things better, or we are doing things better, and by this I don't mean uh, new processes, cleverer processes necessarily. That's one source by which you do things more efficiently, things to do things better. But supposing you improve a road uh, to the port. Supposing you improve the time it takes to put cargo onto the ship. Uh, supposing you build cranes instead of uh, the mazdoor taking, uh, taking the load on his back. All these are productivity improvements in a poor country because we are getting closer to the productivity possibility frontier. In a country like the US or Germany, where you already have cranes doing all the work, where the roads are autobahns, which are perfectly empty most of the time, where you can grow, go really fast, and you can't actually go faster with existing technology, you are at the frontier. So it's perfectly possible for the world, which was a complaint I talked about earlier, to be having very low productivity growth, and for India to have significantly higher productivity growth. And the nice thing about exchange rates, real exchange rates, is to look at competitiveness, you have to subtract from the real exchange rate appreciation the extent to which you have a productivity differential with respect to the rest of the world. If you are more productive on an annual basis than the rest of the world, you can afford some exchange rate appreciation. And in fact, this is the basis of the famous Balasa-Samuelson theorem, which is one part of the reason why poor countries get rich. They get rich because their real exchange rate appreciates as productivity in their industry gets, gets stronger. So this is a long-winded way of saying that don't worry about the exchange rate. It's broadly in the right place. Um, you know, one can debate a little bit up, a little bit down. Um, the, uh, however, there still is a, a group, uh, a very respectable group, uh, which says it doesn't matter whether it's broadly in the right place. Why don't you, RBI, press a button and make it 10% cheaper? And if you press that button and make it 10% cheaper, our exporters will have a wonderful time, and that is going to be great for the country. Now, it's generally economists who advocate a depreciated exchange rate. Most of the uh, uh, public would typically like a stronger rupee because not only does it convey national strength uh, but also you can buy more stuff abroad with that rupee. Uh, imports are cheaper, your cost of your son's education is, uh, is cheaper. So uh, what this reflects is the fact that non-economists are generally consumer focused and look at the cost to a consumer of a depreciated rupee. Of course, the economist takes the very same arguments and says, this is why we should depreciate the exchange rate. Because you're sending your kids abroad instead of sending them to the fine schools here, why don't you send them here instead? You would if you found the foreign degree unaffordable. If the rupee was so cheap relative to the dollar, you wouldn't be able to pay for a dollar education. You would educate your kids here. And varieties of that, you would spend less on foreign goods, you would spend more on domestic goods that would encourage the domestic economy. Clearly, economists are producer-focused rather than consumer-focused. Now, um, the problem, of course, is even while the producer-focused argument sounds interesting and sounds uh, entrancing, uh, there is, if, if I did press this button and depreciate the exchange rate by 10%, there is a, 
a subsidy which is being given to the domestic producers in terms of, uh, uh, of a cheaper exchange rate, but who pays for that subsidy? That subsidy is paid for by domestic consumers and savers. And so the countries that have managed to do this over a sustained long period of time are also countries which had have had limited democratic movements which where uh, the producers have been much stronger in able to suppress the exchange rate and achieve financial repression, giving savers low returns, uh, even while they saved enormous amounts. Uh, in our country, would it be possible, even if we could press this button, to force the consumer to pay artificially high prices for foreign goods? to receive an artificially low interest rate for their savings over a sustained period of time because that artificially low interest rate is absolutely needed to um, reduce the carrying cost of the enormous foreign exchange reserves which we would have to build up in order to keep the exchange rate depreciated. In other words, if you start on this path, it takes a lot of national will to do it and it implies a degree of repression of the consumer and the saver, which we really have to think about whether our country can do it. But forget all this, there's a yet another cost which we're seeing. And that cost is that over the long run, if a country makes investments based on an artificially undervalued exchange rate, it makes the wrong kind of investments. And you can see this happening in the turmoil that is happening to the north of us in China, where a whole horde of industries have come up which are absolutely uncompetitive at a reasonable exchange rate, which is why you have overcapacity that has been built up in, in China. Uh, it's certainly one could argue that this also reflects the experience of Japan in the 1990s, when a whole host of industries, as the Japanese exchange rate came into equilibrium, a whole host of industries turned out to be greatly uncompetitive. So whether, you know, we're again going back to the let's be happy today and be sad tomorrow, whether we're willing to do that, again, is something that we have to ask ourselves. The bottom line that I would argue is the ideal exchange rate for us is neither strong nor weak. It is just right. Okay. And uh, typically, market forces get you to this Goldilocks rate. Um, but we must be aware that markets aren't perfect. There are circumstances when rapid capital inflows or outflows can move the rate to a level that is likely to be unsupported by fundamentals. Now, as a central bank, I don't claim that we know precisely what the right equilibrium level of the exchange rate is at any given point in time. But what we do is we intervene to moderate adjustment whenever we believe the movement in the exchange rate is driven by sentiment likely to be reversed or driven by extreme flows which are unlikely to persist. Our intent here is not to find a level to press a button and say this is the right level. Our intent is to prevent overshooting and undue volatility rather than stand in the way of needed adjustment of the exchange rate to market forces. Now, um, this is in day-to-day -day affairs. We have also seen in that first chart that I showed you of currency depreciation across the world, some currencies have depreciated 40, 50 percent, the ruble, uh, the Brazilian real. Now, that may also be an example of overshooting when temporarily irrationality in the market overwhelms the central bank. Much like a bank run, when you have a falling currency, foreign investors may dump that currency in an attempt to get out before they lose everything, and you can have a significant fall in the currency, which may be experienced by these countries. So what do we do to maintain the orderly movement of the currency? Three ingredients. One, of course, is the good macro stabilization policies that I talked about. Once you have good policies, people look at them and believe broadly that their money is relatively safe. It's not going to uh, get destroyed in the short term, and they're willing to stay longer term. Second is we've focused on attracting stable capital flows that will stay for the longer run. And this means, this is important, it means avoiding temptation. A lot of countries have opened up 
to hot flows because they feel they're the flavor of the moment. They feel uh, you get foreign investment banks coming in every day and saying, open us, you'll get $10 billion tomorrow, you'll get $5 billion, and people buy that and open up. And what happens is this money comes in quickly for a short time, but when your fundamentals change a little or when the global environment changes, it runs out. So one of the things we've tried to do is move the inflows towards the longer run. Not short-term flows, longer-run flows. Uh, we prevent reinvestment in, uh, in uh, rupee bonds of less than three years. And we also uh, try and encourage um, our foreign commercial borrowings now to move to the longer end, uh, especially if the borrower who's taking those borrowings doesn't have foreign exchange earnings. We've also started moving towards borrowing in rupees outside. We want to encourage the masala bond, a, a, an attempt to borrow in rupees outside rather than borrow in dollars so that the foreign exchange risk is held by the outside rather than by our, our corporations. And, and finally, and this has been an encouraging offshoot of the Make in India campaign, a sizable increase in foreign direct investment has happened. Uh, if you look uh, the uh, uh, months till January, of this financial year, we've had close to the, uh, we have certainly had the largest increase in foreign direct investment uh, in, our, in our history, approaching uh, what we reached in 2008, 2009, but with still two months left to go in the year. So uh, I think this is a good sign. This is significantly above our, uh, our external deficit, our current account deficit, and that suggests that we are generally a relatively stable country. Um, the bottom line for our policy towards foreign capital flows is one of steady liberalization, where we try and not be tempted by cheap finance, but try and attract risk-bearing capital into our country, capital that will provide us the equity buffers, the risk-bearing buffers that we don't have in this country, that our middle-class investors don't necessarily uh, want to provide. And uh, we intend to give foreign investors decent returns and to continuously ease and increase their entry and exit in uh, possibilities from the country. Finally, our third line of defense, first was good policy, second was increase the maturity of flows and make them more stable. Third line of defense is our exchange reserves. Uh, we intervene in exchange markets to smooth volatility and typically buy and sell uh, uh, at uh, different times in the year. So it's not unidirectional in any way. So uh, I've said the exchange rate tool is unlikely to be a helpful tool in our quest to increase uh, what we make in India for the rest of the world. So how should we export more? What, what are the ways to increase uh, exports? And I would say the answer is simple. The answer is improve product productivity by building out infrastructure, improving human capital with better schools, colleges, vocational and on-the-job training, simplify business regulation and taxation, and improve access to finance. Fortunately, all this is what the government and the central bank are focused on. So, given there are no easy solutions but a, 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 a path which uh, will, will take time, I'm often asked, uh, what industry should we focus on? What should we encourage as we, uh, as we push exports? And I would say anybody who learns from our past uh, would reach the conclusion, let us not encourage anything. That might be the surest way to kill it. So we have to be very careful about picking industries to support. Uh, instead, let us, let us create a good business environment that can support any kind of activity and then let our fantastic entrepreneurs, of which we have increasing numbers every day, let them figure out what is new and interesting and what businesses they will create. I mean, just to give you a sense of how hard it is to focus on which industry to pick, remember that, um, you know, Pandit Nehru created the IITs uh, in order to supply engineers largely to the commanding heights of the economy, which was uh, occupied by the public sector. But in the 1990s, instead of supplying the commanding heights, what uh, the IITs did was supplied body shops. 
And I'm sure any government official looking at where the bulk of the IITNs were getting jobs would sneer at this and say, what are these body shops doing Y2K stuff for, uh, for, the, uh, for Western uh, firms? But these very body shops are evolving into our world-beating software giants, the Infosys's, the TCS's, and the Wipro's of the world. There wasn't a huge amount of thought into how this would happen and chalking out the path. It happened. Uh, the government was not unimportant. It was extremely important in creating the basic talent pool in this country by enabling the IITs, by the IITians going to work for many public sector firms and then going to work for private sector firms or starting their own firm. But the broader point is, let us not put too much design into this. Let us enable business activity and see what happens. Now, I've gone on for a, a fair amount of time. Let me uh, uh, mention one last thing before ending. Um, one other important area, I've talked about good services, etc., but one very important area of engagement with the world that we need to build on is ideas and analysis. Uh, what do I mean by this? Today we have a seat at most international tables. Many countries want to draw us into multilateral and bilateral tr treaties. Now, when we were unimportant, we used to rail against the proposals that were inimical to us, the proposals that were skewed against us, knowing fully well that it would not make an iota of difference, that the proposal would get passed, passed anyway. Now, as we get more power, uh, we need to develop the capability of using it more effectively. What do I mean by this? Today, it still is an unfortunate reality that international meets are still dominated by the old powers. But it's not as much through brute uh, power of their votes or whatever that they dominate, but it is through the power of the ideas they bring to the table, the agenda setting that they engage in, and the organizational structures that they both dominate as well as create. Today in the G20, I would say that much of the agenda is still set by elements of the old G7. And often we find that they've agreed on their preferred approach by the time they come to the table or by the time we are called to the table. It is only when they disagree, when the big powers disagree, that the rest of us have some hope of influencing outcomes. But the fault is not in the power structure, the fault is in us. Because unless we amongst the emerging world put forward our agenda, build the intellectual and analytical basis for pushing it, and create the variety of coalitions, perhaps with other emerging markets, perhaps with some of the industrial countries, to support it, we have no hope of moving forward. It doesn't matter how much quota increase we get, it's going to be minuscule relative to what we need. So what is encouraging is today, this is starting to happen. The BRICS do discuss policy issues and do try and develop common approaches, but we need to do this on a much larger scale. We need to build coalitions with sympathetic industrial countries, and this can be policy by policy. Some policies, uh, some industrial country would agree with us, other policies, others will. So for this, we need more market intelligence. Who's thinking which way, who's going to work with us? In, a, in India, we need to build capacity in our think tanks, in our universities, to inform our policy makers on how to approach the international policy agenda. We are looking for ideas in the Reserve Bank, certainly uh, when I was working uh, with Mr. Chidambaram in the government. These are places which are eager for ideas uh, and we need to be prepared when we negotiate bilateral and multilateral treaties so that we don't wake up too late to the fact that we've given away the house with very little in return. Uh, with careful analysis, with preparation, with engagement, with coalition building, I have no doubt without any increase in our current power in international organizations, we will be able to influence the uh, international agenda more than we are not now. I'm not saying we are entirely uninfluential. We'll have, be able to do more. But equally important, we'll stop being seen as an obstructionist but ultimately powerless country that we may have been in the past. We will be seen as a serious player. Let me conclude. Uh, Sri Ramnath Goenka focused on unearthing other th facts that would help move the public debate forward. Uh, all too often, as you well know, our public debates generate more noise than illumination, and uh, we should learn from the example that he set. Um, 
as we cope with the global slowdown and as we frame our policies going forward, uh, we do need a public debate about what our policy path will be based on facts, empirical analysis, and sound arguments. Uh, I have laid out a particular view, and you, you, many of you will surely disagree with that view, but I look forward to alternative viewpoints and to evidence uh, that, will, that will show the, um, uh, the, the misconceptions in my ways. Thank you very much.